I bring love and greetings from brothers and sisters who meet at the Mount Barker Ecclesia this morning, uh, doing pretty well exactly the same thing as we are here, though probably to a different theme I'd imagine. So we've taken our reading this morning from Matthew chapter 7, and as we read through Matthew 5, 6 and 7 in the Lord's Discourse on the Mount, we find ourselves really at the crux of what our Lord Jesus Christ is talking about at chapter 7, right at the very end of chapter 7. This is, this is what he says. We'll just read it one more time. Because if we don't get this part of it, brethren and sisters, if we don't get this element of Matthew 5, 6 and 7, then the rest of what Jesus has said for us personally is almost meaningless. So if we don't put it into practice in our own lives, what's the point? So he says this in, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. He says, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works? And then I'll profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And then he tells this parable, doesn't he? The, the one that we, that we know so well. Therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I'll liken him unto a wise man which built his house on a rock. The rain descended, the floods came down, the winds blew and beat upon that house, and, the, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened to a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. They're confronting words, aren't they, brethren and sisters? Very confronting words. Our Lord Jesus Christ is essentially saying to us that if our understanding and our belief of the truth is not seen in action, then our lives are pretty well pointless. You know, there's a saying that is in the world that, that it goes like this. When all's said and done, a lot more is said than done. And I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but when I sit down and I analyse my life, uh, I find myself falling very short in that doing area. I understand the truth. I believe the truth. I can talk to people about the truth. I understand all the theory. That's fine. But sometimes, I don't know about you, but that's not always translated into action. See, the truth requires action. Life and the truth requires us doing things. Those that were on the mountain understood that with our Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what Christ ends up saying, isn't it? If we don't act on our faith, then like the foolish man, our destruction is going to be complete. Great was the fall of it. That will be our downfall, says our Lord Jesus Christ. So they're confronting words. So if we hear the word of God, we've got to act on it. There's no excuses. There's no wriggle room. And every single one of us is accountable for that. And we think about these two houses that are here in Matthew, the house on the rock and we've got the house on the sand, and both houses to the naked eye, they look totally normal. Both houses, we'd say, are people that are in the truth. Both houses are people that might be doing the things of the truth. They might, they might be, uh, you know, your model Christadelphians, as it were. They might be at the Sunday morning meetings, they might be at the Wednesday classes, the Sunday night lectures, whatever it might be, the youth groups. They might be at all that. They're doing the right kind of thing. So from the outside, they look totally the same. But when it rains, one of them's left exposed. And the difference between these two houses, as Jesus points out, is the foundations. And so we ask ourselves the question, what are our foundations like? How are our foundations? What are we doing to shore up those foundations in our homes, in our own personal lives? What are we like when it comes to Bible reading or to instilling spiritual concepts into the minds of our kids or talking about spiritual concepts uh, as a husband and wife? 
And as a general rule, brethren and sisters, I think we're fairly good at those sort of things. We're fairly, fairly good as a, as a community at those areas. We focus a lot on these things. And almost all our discussions of a Sunday afternoon after the meeting are uh, focused on spiritual concepts, whether that's talking about the, the exhort or the lecture or the, uh, the Bible class, or whether it's talking to someone who might need support or help, or we're talking about something that we've looked at during the week, or whatever it might be, a lot of our conversations are actually focused on spiritual things. And so we are very good at developing those foundations and focusing on those foundations as a, as a general rule. But the foundations aren't just theory. We often think of it as just theory, but the foundations are a lot more than just theory. How are we at developing the foundations of practice? At work, for example. How are we at developing the foundations of practice? We often find that practice is extremely important, don't we? We know in the, in the workplace, uh, you might have someone that comes straight out of uni. I'm a teacher, so uh, we might have someone that comes straight out of uni and they can quote you all the theory. They can quote your Harvard thinking routines and Blooms and De Bono and all these educational theorists. They can quote you that. But they'll never get their students to the top of the state without practice. Uh, how are we at developing our foundations in practice, brethren and sisters? Our theory has to be put into practice. So that when we see people in need, we can go to them confidently. When we see a young person struggling spiritually, we know what to say. When we see someone, brethren and sisters, who's practicing behaviour that we know is not right, we know how to deal with that issue. We know how to deal with that issue because it becomes, becomes part of who we are. And we're developing those foundations in practice so that when these troubles come along, we know how to deal with it. There's no point just having the theory and not practicing it, and then when something erupts, you don't know what to do. We've got to be developing the foundations of practice now. And so in Matthew 7, Jesus is very clear. He says that, is, that doing is fundamental, fundamental in our lives in the truth. And exact, that's exactly what he says in verse 21, isn't it? He says, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. So they're believers. But, here's the qualification, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. That does the will of God. We had an exhortation at Mount Barker oh, a couple of months ago by Brother Dave Hill, and he actually did along a similar theme, pardon me, similar theme to this. And he actually said this. He asked us the question, he said, what is the will of God? And it got me thinking, I, I hadn't really thought about that. What, so ask yourself, what is the will of God? Just take a moment, just, just think about that. What is the will of God? Because if we're going to be in the kingdom, we want to be in the kingdom, we'll be found doing the will of God. So what is the will of God? It's not something we normally think about. We've probably all got different, um, I suppose, perspectives on how we might approach that. It's not, not, not a doctrine that we normally talk about. But what is his will? We know his purpose. God's purpose is to fill the earth with his glory, isn't it? We know that. And his will, I believe, is intricately linked to that. See, filling the earth with God's glory means filling the earth with people who manifest him, who show his character. And you think, well, what's God's character? Well, long-suffering, merciful, gracious, abundant in goodness and truth, giving mercy for thousands, etc., etc. We know that. It's something that's characterised in 1 John 4, verse 8, as love. That's what God wants to fill the earth with. That's the purpose of God, to fill the earth with people that show that character of love. That's what he wants. His will, brethren and sisters, is intricately linked to that. I'll just read you a couple of passages. In Matthew 18, you don't have to turn these up. Matthew 18, he says, Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. In other words, it's the will of God that he wants to save. John 6, verse 39, And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that all of which he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. 1 Timothy 2, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Saviour, who will have all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And then you've got your classic one in 1 Peter, don't we? God's not willing that any should perish. So God's will is intricately linked to him showing his character in the whole world. 
He wants to save. That's God's will. The will of God, brethren and sisters, is about, is about wanting people in the kingdom, wanting others in the kingdom, wanting all to be saved, none to perish. And if we want people in the kingdom of God, we're going to love them. And if we really do love them, we're going to show it. That's the common sense uh, flow of events. So the question for us, brothers and sisters, is how do we show love for other people? How do we do the will of God in preaching? How do we preach at school or at work or, or at uni? Is it just in word or is it in action as well? Preaching the truth in love, as Paul says in Ephesians. What do we like in our preaching and doing God's will in that way? Are we very good when it comes to explaining why there's no supernatural devil, but substandard when it comes to actually showing what it means to have the character of God, the character of Christ uh, in us? What about in the ecclesia? What do we like at doing the will of God in the ecclesia? About wanting our brothers and sisters to be there. Do we show that? What are we doing as an individual within the ecclesia to do that? For example, how do we build one another up? When Paul talks about that to, to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, he says to build one another up. What are we doing to build others up in their walk in the truth? Because we know that it's difficult. We all know it's difficult. So when we see someone doing the right thing or doing something good, do we praise them? Do we say that's fantastic? I don't know, it's an Australian cultural thing that we don't like to have like this tall poppy syndrome, so we like to cut people down, but that's almost the opposite to what Paul's talking about there. What do we like at doing the will of God and encouraging our brothers and sisters to show God's character? Because the more encouragement that we get, the more we're likely to uh, keep those actions going. What about offering support? giving support to those in need, especially those who might be struggling spiritually. Do we want them in the kingdom? Of course we do. What are we doing to show that? So it's very easy for us, brethren and sisters, when we see people that might be struggling with their faith to be cynical or to be judgmental. It's very, very easy for us to do that. It's very easy for us to be cynical or judgmental of that young person who might be dating someone outside the truth. It's very easy for us to be cynical or judgmental of that family that doesn't want to come along anymore or might be sporadic in their attendance. It might be very easy for us to be cynical or judgmental of that young person that posts things on Facebook that are unsavoury. It's very easy for us to fall into that trap. How do we act towards people in that situation who are obviously struggling with their faith? What are we doing to try and help them, to encourage them in faith? Because being cynical and being judgmental doesn't help. Even if it's in our own lounge rooms, it doesn't help. We know that. Of a necessity, brethren and sisters, we must act on our faith in a loving, loving way towards our brothers and sisters because that is the will of God being outworked in our own lives. And that's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 7. And it needs to be sincere. It can't just be something we go through the motions. This has to be something that's extremely sincere. The Lord Jesus Christ, I believe, if you keep your finger there or marker there, come back to Isaiah 58. Because he's actually, I think, taking his words, or his ideas at least, from Isaiah 58. So our actions, our actions have to be sincere. When we see people in need, we can't just go through the motions in an uncaring or an unloving way. So when we see someone that might need a meal, for example, or, or they're going through a trial of some sort, we can't say, oh, look, they've got their own... They've put themselves in this situation. They, oh, I can't believe that they do this again. You know, they need to learn. You know, you know I'll, I'll make them a meal, but, you know what, well, this is the last time. They need to learn a lesson. It's not sincere. Or it might be something that we're, we see someone in need and say, well, I'll, I'll make you a meal. And we, you know, we polish up our halo, as it were. That's not for them. That's for us. That's not sincere. 
And that's what our Lord Jesus Christ is talking about in Matthew chapter 7. They're the ones that he's not interested in. He's not interested in that attitude. What he wants is someone that has a sincere faith, that acts on their faith in a sincere way. And so Isaiah 58 is where I think our Lord's quoting from. He's actually talking about fasting in that time. Pick it up in verse 3. He says this, Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? So they're fasting, they're doing the right things. They're making a meal, as it were. They're fasting, they're doing right things of, of faith, but their, their attitude's all wrong. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and you don't see? Why have we afflicted our soul and you don't take any knowledge? And then God says, Behold, in the day of your fast you find pleasure. You're doing it for yourselves, you're not doing it for me. And you exact all your labours. Behold, you strive for fast and debate, and you smite with the fist of wickedness. You shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. Is this such a fast that I have chosen, a day for man to afflict his soul and to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call that a fast, an acceptable day to the Lord? Oh, they were fasting, but it was insincere. They were doing the right things, but their attitude was completely wrong. That's not what God wants. That's not what our Lord Jesus Christ wants. They want us to act in a pure way, from a pure heart. And so this is what he says in verse 6. Isn't this the fast that I've chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry and that thou bring the poor that are cast out into, into, into thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. That's what God wants. That's the attitude that God wants. It's about showing love sincerely. In action. To other people. We need to do something, brethren and sisters. We need to do something. Doing for others, not for ourselves. Doing for them. The truth can't just be an academic exercise. It's got to be seen in action, and that requires doing, and doing in love for other people. Come over to Matthew 25, because our Lord Jesus Christ talks about that same thing on that occasion as well. This is right, uh, the, the parable right, um, that he speaks about the, the end times when he's going to return. So he's talking about the judgment seat here. In verse 35, it says, For I was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison? And came unto thee. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you've done this to one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. These are all things, brethren and sisters, that people have done. That people have done. These are people who have developed the foundations and practice in doing. And they've done it so much that it's just like second nature to them. They don't even realise that they've done anything. It's just part of who they are. The, the love of God is dwelling within them and the, they just want to do, they just act. They don't think about it, they just do it. But the point is, they do it. Let's look at what they did. They, look at what they've done. These people have seen someone in need and they've acted. No questions. No cynicism. No judgment. They've seen a need and they acted. They saw someone who's hungry. So they fed, they fed them, they gave them food. Saw someone who's thirsty, so they gave him a drink. They saw someone naked, so they clothed them. They saw someone who didn't have any friends, so they became a friend to them. They saw someone sick, so they went to visit them. They saw someone in prison, they went to visit them. The people, brethren and sisters, that Jesus says will be in the kingdom are those kinds of people those who see others in need and act. They do whatever they can to try and meet the needs of others. 
And when we look at the situations that are described here, brothers and sisters, we can see that these are people who are going through trial and fairly significant trial. I'm sure that we can all think of brothers or sisters who at this very time are going through trial. We can all think of brothers and sisters who are in need. In fact, you're probably thinking of someone right now. And when we think of them, I don't know if you're like me, but our, our conscience is pricked. We want to reach out. We want to help. We do. We, we, you know, we go home from the meeting full of these really good intentions and we, we, we think about that brother or sister. We say, yeah, this week, you know what, I'm going to go and see them or I'm going to do this or that or the other. But you know what we do? If you're like me, we procrastinate. We get home from the meeting full of these good intentions, but the pressures of life come on us, don't they? And, you know, one thing just leads to another. You know, the kids have to be fed and, you know, they've got homework to do at school and there's washing that's got to be done all the time. And you've got to mow the lawn, you've got to do stuff in the yard. There's all these other things that just seem to creep in. And for all our good intentions, we end up doing nothing. Even though the intention was there. You know what else I tend to do? I don't know if you're like me, but we overanalyse the situation. We think, oh, what's the best time to call? What's the best thing to say? I'm, I'm just not sure. And what, what we end up doing is we end up giving ourselves reasons why it's not the best time to call. We give ourselves reasons as to why we, we can't visit that person. You know, it might be dinner time. We got home from work. Um, you know, well, they're home from work too. You know, it's a, I'm just not sure about what's going on in their family. Oh, they've got little kids. What time do they eat? Are they putting them to bed? You know, this is a whole thing that can stretch for four or five hours of an afternoon. There's always things going on in the household. But we overanalyze. We say, oh, it's not the best time to call, or it's not the best thing uh, that's, that, that we can do. And what we end up doing is nothing for all our good intentions. You know, over the last three or four months, um, Kate and I, Kate's my wife, uh, we've gone through a fairly significant trial with our son. He was diagnosed with a fairly rare blood disorder um, at the start of the year. He ended up uh, getting all these bruises all over him and, you know, funny rashes on his skin and nosebleeds that wouldn't stop. Stupidly, we looked it up on the internet and it's all the symptoms of leukaemia. Thankfully, it's not. Uh, but it's the, the alternative isn't, isn't much better. So we've been through the ringer for the last few months, uh, but we have been absolutely overwhelmed, overwhelmed by the love and support that we've received from brothers and sisters. And during this time, brothers and sisters, I've been taught a massive, massive lesson in caring for others, an enormous lesson in caring for others. Because you know what? There's never a better time to reach out to someone in need than right now. There is never a better time than right now. And we've been overwhelmed by the love and, and sympathy and cards and gifts that Taj has received. Um, here's my son here that he's received. And we're so thankful and so humbled by that. But you know what else we've found? And this isn't to minimise what anyone else has done because we are extremely humbled and very thankful for what's happened. But perhaps those that have been the most responsive, the most responsive to this trial that we've been experiencing are those who have gone through significant trial or are currently going through significant trial themselves. And I ask the question why? Why are people that have gone through trial and significant trial, so much more responsive as a general rule um, within the community. The only thing that I can come up with, and I've thought about this long and hard, is that they know what it's like. Yes, they know what trial's like, how, however varied that may be, but I think they also know just how much the support means when you're in the middle of it. And I've been taught a massive lesson about that. In fact, I've copped a, a pretty big serve from God about that, about my attitude in caring for others. I've learnt four main things, I've summarised them into four at least anyway. 
First one is we can't overanalyze a situation because there's never a better time than right now to comfort someone that's, that's going through trial. So do it right now. Not right now, because we're in the meeting, but when you get home. <laughs> the other thing I've learned is you can't say the wrong thing. It's almost impossible to say the wrong thing. So you, we can't overanalyze and say, well, oh, I don't know what to say. Just say something. Say you're there in support. Unless you're completely heartless, you can't say the wrong thing. The other thing I've learned is that people that are going through trial need support. They need to know that people care. Do you know the biggest thing I've noticed? This is speaking particularly to brothers, and this has been to me. Brothers can't piggyback on the good works of their wives. I don't know if you're like me, brothers and sisters, but when I see people in trial, I just don't know how to help. I just don't know how to help. And maybe there's nothing physical that we can do. Maybe there's nothing physical like in Matthew 25 where someone's in sick, is sick or in prison or they're hungry or thirsty or, or naked or whatever it might be. Maybe there's nothing physical that we can see or that we can do. But every person that's going through trial needs support. Every person that's going through, this isn't a cry for help by the way, um, every person that's going through trial needs support. And I just wonder if Jesus was saying these words here in Matthew 25 today, what would he say making it relevant for our society? Would he say, I was down and you called me up or you sent me a Facebook message? Would he say, I was being persecuted for standing up for the truth and you sent me an SMS of support? We actually had a sister say to us uh, one Sunday, she said, Look, I, I know you're going through trial. I don't know how to help, but I want to. I don't know how to help, but I want to. If there's anything that you need, please call on me. And it, was, it just blew me away. So I just wonder, brethren and sisters, are these the sorts of things that the Lord Jesus Christ would say today for us to do? Because we can all do something. Every single one of us are without excuse. You know what we can all do? And it's extremely easy. Pray. We can all pray. We know the power of prayer. We know the power of prayer so well. But how much more comforting is it, brethren and sisters, how much more comforting is it for those who are going through trial or being prayed about to know that they're being prayed about? So if we're praying for someone, let them know. It might be as simple um, short prayer that we might say. We might just shoot them a Facebook message saying, look, you're in our prayers. It might be an ecclesial prayer on a Sunday morning where uh, perhaps there's someone who's going through trial within the ecclesia. Pray for them. Even if they're there, it might be a tad awkward at the time, but how much more, how much more does that mean for that brother or sister who's going through that trial to know that they're being prayed about, to know that people care? Or maybe we can do a special ecclesial prayer uh, for people that are going through trial, significant trial. And we can just stop what we're doing. On a Sunday morning, for example, um, after the announcements, and we can just stop and say a, a special prayer just for that person. There's no reason why we can't do those sorts of things. And every single one of us, brethren and sisters, can pray. And every single one of us can tell people that we're praying about that we are praying about them. And the enormous um, support that that does give to those people going through trial um, is, is amazing. So when we hear of our brothers and sisters that are going through trial, what do we do? What do we do? What have we done? When we hear of our brothers and sisters in Nepal, who just had that massive earthquake, and we know that there's massive devastation, I don't know exactly what the situation was, there's no lives lost apparently. But we don't know the situation, well, I don't know the situation in regards to the, the housing situation that they've got or anything like that, but from the photos it looks horrendous. What are we doing when we see our brothers and sisters in need overseas? 
What are we doing about that? When we see that the ACBM has put out a, a flyer or a, a call for, for funds, what are we doing about that? I'm sure if you're like me, brothers and sisters, the conscience is pricked. This is where the rubber hits the road. Because if we've got the will to do something and do nothing, what help is that to them, for example, over in Nepal? We see their need. What are we doing to meet that need? Just come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. So Paul here is talking um, about the Jerusalem Poor Fund in 2 Corinthians 8. And we actually find the same concepts coming up. So it's about the Jerusalem Poor Fund and Paul's taking up a collection for all the poor brothers and sisters who are over in Jerusalem. And the Corinthian brothers and sisters, their, their conscience is pricked. Initially it's pricked. They want to do something. They want to help. And there's this great call of, a cry of concern for them. And they're wanting to give to their cause of their wealth. As a general rule throughout the whole Asia region, that was the case. Corinth was a little bit different. So we see this in verse 10. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 10. And herein I give my advice. For this is expedient for you who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Now therefore, perform the doing of it. That as was, there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which you have. For if there be first a willing mind is accepted according to that a man has, and not according to as he has not. Twelve months ago, they saw the need. Twelve months ago, Paul came to them and said, your poor brothers and sisters over in Jerusalem need your help. Twelve months ago, their conscience was pricked. But what have they done about it? The answer is nothing. So Paul urges them to remember those brothers and sisters. You know what this teaches me, brothers and sisters? This teaches me that if we've let things slide, it's never too late to start. It's never too late to offer that word of comfort or to send that meal. It's never too late to make that trip to the hospital with that, that sister. It's never too late to pull that card out of our cabinet drawer, which perhaps, if you like our house, we have. That card that's been sitting in the drawer waiting for that person, which we just didn't know what to say on it, to pull it out of the drawer and write on it and send it. It's never too late. That's what this is telling me. It's never too late to start. And so Paul urges them to complete the work that they set out to do a year ago. Because at the moment, all they've done is they've made themselves feel good in thinking that they want to help. But practically, they have done nothing. When we see a need in our ecclesia, brethren and sisters, or in others, we've got to act. We've got to do something about it. You notice here in verse 12, Paul says, to give as you're able. So don't go extreme. Don't be silly about it, because you're just going to create a problem somewhere else. But you give as you're able, and we all know what we're able to give, and we all know what's substandard. Paul understands that. He said, you give as you're able, but you have to do something. You have to do it. James talks about this as well. Come over to James, James chapter 2. He says, if we see someone in need, we have to actually act on that. Because if you have the will to do it and you do nothing, it's useless. What does it profit, says James? You've actually done nothing. You haven't done anything. So verse 14 What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and has not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. So how often, brethren and sisters, do we see a person in need of something and offer a meaningless statement? It might be the sister, the single sister, who's so poor that she has to get groceries from the food bank. And we say to her, oh, I hope you'll be okay. 
you know, we're being nice. But you can see she's not. She's getting her groceries from the food bank. She's, she's got no money. You can see there's a problem. And offering a meaningless word? Or what about that brother who's lost his job? Oh, chin up, mate. Chin up. You'll get another one. Why don't you try the mines or something? He's in need now. You can see his need now. He's got a mortgage. He's got mouths to feed. And we say, chin up. We're being nice, but there's a mismatch between what's needed and what's given. And sure, people may have made bad decisions. They may have made bad decisions. And sure, sometimes we can be cynical about that. <clears throat> But the reality is we need to deal with what's going on now in their lives. The why they're there, that can be dealt with later. Now they're suffering. Now they need comfort. Regardless of how they got there in the first place, that's not the issue. We need to do something about their situation now. Deal with the present. <clears throat> we actually find these same concepts in Luke 10, with the parable of the Good Samaritan. So we'll just, just turn that one up as well. So the Good Samaritan in this, this parable could have been all cynical. He could have been all judgment, judgmental about how this person got into that situation. He could have thought, oh, what a fool. Who on earth, who in their right mind would travel down that road knowing that there's robbers and, and you know, beat up guys um, along the way? Who in their right mind would go down there knowing that that was so dangerous? Why should... Why should I go and risk my life for him? He could have taken the self-righteous stance. He said, well, you know, actions have consequences. And he could have quoted scripture about why he shouldn't go down there, misquote scripture. You reap what you sow. I shouldn't put myself out for that, that person. He could have been very frustrated with the man. So oh, people like this, they just need to be taught a lesson. But he wasn't. He could have been like that. Verse 30. And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jer Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed leaving him half dead. Just like in James, he's destitute of, and naked and um, destitute of daily food. His garments have all been stripped off him. Verse 31. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed on the other side. And likewise the Levite, when he was at, his, at the place, came and looked on him and passed on by the other side. These two men, brethren and sisters, these two men were as useful to this beaten and, and beat up man on the ground, covered in mud and dirt and blood, as the person who says, depart, be warmed and filled. That's how much use they are to this person. You know what's at stake though? eternal life. That's what this whole passage is about in verse 25. It's eternal life. That's the issue. That's what's at stake. If we see people in need and do nothing, that's what's at stake. It's no wonder Jesus says in Matthew 7, great was the fall of it. Or in Luke 6 where he's talking the Sermon on the Plain, the destruction is complete. But what about the response of the Samaritan? Let's look at that in verse 33. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. He loved him. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. He set his, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said, Take care of him, and whatsoever more thou spendest, when I come... I'll repay you. Which now of these thinkest thou was neighbour unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said unto him, He that showed mercy to him. And Jesus says, You go and do the same. This is a man, brethren and sisters, whose conscience was initially pricked. He saw someone else in need and he felt for him. But what he does next is what separates him from the others. He does something. He acts on it. He saw the needs. 
He saw the man was in trouble, so he goes to him. He does something. He saw that he's got wounds, so he binds them up. He does something. He sees there's a risk of infection, so he cleans them out. He does something. He sees that there's a need for transport, so he puts him on his own beast. He does something. He takes him to the inn and because he needs rest. He does something. He pays for him because he knows that he's been robbed. He does something. He could have passed by and thought, what an idiot for travelling down that road. But he doesn't. This is a man who gave as he was able. This is a man, brothers and sisters, in whom dwells the love of God. What good were the Levite and the, the priest or the lawyer? Nothing. Because neighbours do something. People who love the will of God do something. People who have faith do something. I just want to read you a couple of passages. 1 John 3 verse 17. But whoso has this world's good and sees his brother have need and shuts up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwells the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. James 1 verse 22, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. And then later, a couple of verses later, he says, but whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, not being a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, shall be blessed in his deed. And then the last verse of James 1, isn't it, is true religion is under, and undefiled is this, to keep oneself unspotted from the world, and as a general rule as a community, we've, we've done pretty well with that. But what about the second part? We haven't placed perhaps as much emphasis as we need to on that, but to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, when they're going through trial. And James 4 verse 17. Therefore, to him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. Now, there's some pretty, pretty big statements there, brethren and sisters, and I don't know about you, but when I read this, I find it very confronting because there's no wriggle room. We either act on our faith or we don't. It's that simple. And so our exhortation this morning really is, I suppose, when, when we see our brothers and sisters and even the community at large in need, that we actually do something about it. I don't know about you, but I often find myself falling short and having a lot of answers or questions to answer in that regard. We've spoken a lot about doing things and a lot about works this morning, brethren and sisters, and you'd be forgiven for saying, now, just a second, Evan, just hang on a sec. We aren't saved by works. We're saved by grace. And we'd say Ephesians 2 verse 8, Evan, says we are saved by grace. Absolutely, and I'd say you are 100% correct. Absolutely right. We're not saved by works. We are saved by grace. It doesn't matter how much we do. We can never, ever, ever be in God's debt. Ever. But that passage in Ephesians 2 also says this, by grace you are saved through faith. So faith is what grace operates on. And if there's no faith, then grace can't operate. And we know from James that faith without works is dead. In fact, it's not faith. Whatever it might be, it's not faith. And if that's not faith, then grace can't operate. Faith is the foundation on which grace performs. So effectively, even if we believe, but we don't act, our faith is dead. So Paul, when Paul's saying, by grace you're saved through faith, he's saying that a practical faith, a working faith, a living faith, is the basis on which God hangs grace. And if we don't have that, if we don't have that, then grace can't operate. We're effectively without hope. And that's why when our Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 25 says at the judgment seat, when he sees the, uh, we come into the kingdom, what does he say to the, to the faithful? He says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. A, a practical faith, brethren and sisters, is the basis on which faith, sorry, grace operates. And so now as we come to look at the emblems. We just want to close with uh, one passage in John, John 15. We think about our own lives and we contemplate the actions of our Lord Jesus Christ. We think about our appreciation 
and love for our Lord and his sacrifice for us. The Lord Jesus Christ saw our need. We're sinners, worthy of nothing but death. And yet he went to the cross for us. He did something for us. He saw our need and he died for us. It was an active love. And it's a love that we want to respond to. And that response needs to be seen in actions that reflect our Lord and our appreciation for what he's done. So John 15, verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. We ask ourselves, brethren and sisters, are we Jesus' friend? We say, yes, yes, Jesus is my friend. That's not the question. Are we Jesus' friend? Because Jesus lays down the test, and we are only his friends if we pass this test. And the test is this, in verse 14. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. 